This lecture is uh, focused on decolonizing knowledge and Eurocentrism, specifically uh, focusing on international relations. As a first step, what we'll do is define what Eurocentrism is and then see uh, how it uh, sort of influences our narratives of international relations. From there on, uh, we will move uh, more into the nature of disciplinary knowledge and what decolonizing it might mean. Uh, to start off then, Eurocentrism uh, is a system of knowledge. There, there's uh, at times a misunderstanding in terms of taking Eurocentrism to be just about location about where you're situated. But uh, uh, in reality, it's about a system of knowledge that enacts spatio-temporal hierarchies that puts Europe at the center and as the originator of most developments that we characterize as being progressive. Uh, what does the spatio-temporal hierarchies mean uh, is the question then. Uh, what happens is that spatially we divide Europe from every other space, uh, whereby any development that happens within uh, that space that we have constructed as Europe is understood to be self-sustaining or, or, or self-generative. Its origins are within that space. Uh, and then we, of course, create the different binaries that go along with it, which is if you have Europe, you have the non-Europe. If you have West, you have non-West. Uh, furthermore, we establish temporal hierarchies that go along with that. As Europe is separated from every other space, it's also put temporally ahead of every other space, which means that in that developmental scale, everything happens first in Europe and then gets exported outside, right? To other spaces uh, that are uh, deemed as non-Europe. And this happens through a host of binaries, right? Which are both uh, spatially designated, but also temporally designated. So that you have Europe, non-Europe, West, non-West, but also modern, traditional that work into it or developed, underdeveloped. All of these are spatially and temporally uh, situated. And it is uh, because we continue to sort of make sense of the world through these spatio-temporal hierarchies that we write international relations uh, in a specific manner. So Eurocentrism in international relations can be understood as the uh, progressive narrative of history uh, that continues to situate Europe at the center of all historical developments. Uh, in that sense, we will first uh, focus on the historical narratives in IR. A good example of uh, what happens in, in uh, the story of international relations is that uh, we situate all developments as having originated in Europe and then exported outside. As such, the stories of the international focus predominantly uh, on the Western perspective, on the Western story of the international. But furthermore, the concepts through which uh, international relations are made intelligible, such as the international system, Westphalian sovereignty or security, uh, reflect the absence of uh, spaces outside of Europe. Right? All of these concepts are taken to have originated uh, within that space designated as Europe. Uh, a good example of that is uh, the way in which we talk about the expansion of the international system, whereby we talk about it as if uh, the evolution of the international system uh, started in Europe and then was expanded outside as other uh, political entities uh, became independent. Right? Uh, but the telling the story of the evolution of the international system in that manner uh, completely overlooks that it happened at the same time as imperialism and presents an incomplete picture to us, right? Because 
the European space was not separate from all other spaces. There was constant interaction, there was constant communication that was ongoing, uh, which means that the story of the development of uh, the international system is at best an incomplete one. Okay. And this is why uh, within the, the narrative of international relations, uh, it is important to ask a series of historiographical questions in order for us to uh, problematize uh, what it is that might have been overlooked, what it is that is, might be missing from these narratives of international relations. And part of the question, uh, questions to be asked are, how was the story framed? Uh, what were the periodizations made? <clears throat> how did these framings, periodizations, classifications fit into the general narrative of events? And who was the subject of history? And you can ask these questions in terms of problematizing this general uh, narrative that we have that flows in, in somewhat of a progressive manner, which assumes that you have the Congress of Vienna, the 1848 revolutions, the German unification, First World War, interwar period, Second World War. Uh, the way we tell these events in these consecutive uh, manners, uh, again, is, is focused primarily on the Western story. Uh, but even more so, because of that structures, what we find to be important when we discuss international relations. Uh, if we uh, focus on the story as it is set, uh, balance of power becomes a very important point to underline. But uh, if we do take into account that all of these developments, all of these events were happening at the same time as imperialism, uh, empire becomes a very important part uh, of international relations. As such, telling the story in one manner as opposed to another manner uh, does influence which categories, which uh, problems become uh, more important in international relations. In a sense, it, it structures what becomes visible to us as a problem to solve and what remains invisible to us as a problem uh, that we are unable to see. Uh, and one of the ways in which uh, post-colonial uh, international relations specifically has addressed this issue uh, has been through underlying what is called <clears throat> entangled or connected histories. Uh, Connected histories uh, specifically is put forward by Sanjay Subramaniam and furthered by the work of uh, Gurminder Bambra. Uh, and, and what it underlines uh, predominantly is to go beyond that spatial separation that is part of Eurocentrism as a system of knowledge. Right? So rather than taking everything that happens uh, as solely happening in Europe or originating in Europe, uh, we look beyond those spatial separations and see how all events are connected with each other. Okay. Because what uh, sort of Eurocentrism as a system of knowledge does is analytically separate uh, spaces uh, in order to sort of uh, limit the way in which we can think uh, of possibilities. And what Connected Histories does is sort of underline that the spatial separation needs to be rethought because uh, if we do take into account uh, what was happening uh, during those times, uh, during the 19th century, uh, as was mentioned, it was also a time of imperialism. Nothing was happening in isolation uh, from the imperial uh, connections. Right? So it is actually impossible to talk about any development uh, without taking into account that it happened at the same time as imperialism. They were all shaping each other. Uh, 
Another important aspect of this is, uh, one aspect is, of course, the, the uh, connections. The other aspect is, uh, as I mentioned before, what becomes visible or invisible to us within the, the structure of the narrative of international relations that we have. And, uh, and a good example of that is the discussions on the Haitian Revolution. Uh, or whereby uh, especially Robbie Shilliam and Siba Gravogi have done a lot of work. Uh, and when you, uh, what happens is within the, our, our structure of the narrative of international relations, which goes from, uh, like I mentioned, the French Revolution to the Congress of Vienna and uh, 1848 revolutions, we have a, set, a certain narrative of progress that is constantly situated within the space designated as Europe. And uh, in that narrative, once you put in uh, the Haitian revolution into that narrative, the centrality of Europe actually uh, becomes questioned. Right? Because the only event, uh, world changing event that is happening is not actually just happening in Europe. It's also happening in other parts of the world. And once you add that to the narrative, who is the agent of progress or who is the subject of history can change. Um, as I mentioned, these are uh, some ways in which the historical narrative of uh, international relations can be questioned so that the spatial and temporal hierarchies through which uh, we make sense of the world are questioned and problematized and, and uh, we can uh, sort of uh, provide narratives that do not fall back upon these hierarchies.